welcome to the most horrible history lesson ever, or should that be the best ever? Bits of history that your teachers could never tell you, with all the gory bits left in. <coughs> Kellogg's has teamed up with Horrible Histories, and with the writer Terry Deary, uh, that's me, <coughs> to bring you a series of disgusting tales from some of the most famous periods in history. Some of them are so foul, you may even have to hold your nose and close your eyes as you listen to them. This is one of six CDs in the series, available free on special packs of Corn Flakes, Frosties, Cocoa Pops and Rice Krispies. Each 30-minute CD is exclusive to Kellogg's, so you'll be one of the few people to know about some of the darkest secrets from the days of old. You may just want to eat your breakfast before pinning back your ears. Enjoy! There's a very green island out on the western edge of Europe, and the island's called Ireland, which makes sense. And this is the story of Incredible Ireland. People arrived in Ireland from Europe about 10,000 years ago. They came to hunt and fish, but they didn't open fish shops because chips hadn't been invented. Then, just over 2,000 years ago, the Celts arrived to rule for more than a thousand years. These fierce warriors were great fighters. But I have to tell you the shocking truth. They used to fight with no clothes on. Well, that would really put the enemy off, wouldn't it? Imagine, if you were facing a Celt warrior with no clothes on, you wouldn't know where to look. You certainly wouldn't know where to chop. They believed their ancient gods would protect them when they ran into battle. They also thought their ancient gods would like the odd enemy head as a trophy from the battle. So they didn't just try to kill the enemy, they tried to lop off his head and take it home. A nice present for the wife and kids. Then in 431 AD, the Pope in Rome sent Saint Palladius to teach the Irish about Christianity. And then he sent St. Patrick to finish the job. And it worked. Patrick may be Ireland's most popular saint, but when he arrived he was not so popular with the priests of the old Celt religion, the Druids. The Druids came up with this nasty poem attacking St. Paddy. Over the sea comes Chopperhead, crazed in the head, his cloak has a hole for the head, his stick is bent in the head. He will speak unholy words from the table in front of his house and all his people will answer, Amen, Amen. They didn't like him, did they? Still, those old Celts turned Christian and suddenly got all embarrassed about fighting with no clothes on. They got dressed. Some of them got dressed as monks and lived in great monasteries. Peace at last. All they had to worry about was a deadly plague in 664 AD that wiped out thousands. You were covered in black blotches and died. But they soon had something to take their minds off a spot of plague. Along came some new invaders to push the Celts around. This time, they were the vicious Vikings. The Vikings were famous for robbing and burning the great monasteries, but local Irish lords plundered far more. In 795 AD, the Vikings arrived. They robbed and destroyed the country, but especially picking on the poor monks. The Vikings set up a new city called Dublin. Mind you, by 844, the Irish king Fedelmid is robbing and wrecking more monks than the Vikings. But the monks, those men of peace, fight back and kill him. <coughs> men of peace, king in pieces. In 851 AD, Vikings from Denmark arrive in Dublin and attack the Vikings from Norway who are already there. The Irish join in and help wipe out any Vikings they can. This is not a safe time or place to live, as you can see. Then, in 1014, blood rained from the sky. Soldiers were attacked by spears that flew out of walls and by ravens with iron beaks. Uh, that's what horrible historians of the time said, anyway. In an Irish versus Viking battle at Clontarf, the Irish king Brian Baruma wins, but is killed before he can be king of all Ireland. 
that's early Irish history for you. Cutthroat Celts, vicious Vikings, putrid plague and mad monks. Things could only get... worse. Horrible history. Yes, those early days in Ireland were dangerous. Tales are told of terrors that will make your flesh creep and your hair stand on end. So have a hairbrush handy to flatten it down as I tell you the true tale of Morn O'Clammy and her blood-soaked bridal barge. The Irish noblewoman, Morn O'Glamy, was just setting off to marry the handsome Aaron Rowe when she got a message from the groom. I've got a bit of a problem, my love. Those villainous O'Flaherty men are out for trouble and they attack me on my way to our wedding. I'm a little wounded, but I'll join you soon. Turn back and wait for me at Sligo Rock, love, Aaron. Morn went to Sligo Rock and waited a month and it was no show row. Then she woke one night to hear a strange sound and rushed out to see a barge. Aaron and his fifty men were chained to the blood-soaked deck of the barge, dead as cowpats and just as covered in flies. She ran down to the barge and climbed aboard. She wrapped her Aaron Rowe in the red wedding cloak she'd made for him and watched over the corpses for a week. So far, this is all believable. It's just the last bit that starts to add fairy tale to the history. After a week, Morn, who should have been called Mournful, covered the faces of the corpses with gold dust to preserve them. A bit late there, mate. Then she set the barge adrift, drank a cup of poisoned wine, and lay down on the barge which her servants set alight. Naturally, if you go to Sligo Rock, you can still see the ghostly barge with its golden warriors sailing into the night. Creepy, oh what? Horrible history. Here are a top ten of incredible Irish cures from the Middle Ages. They are cures you would not want to try. See if you can guess what they are for. Cure number ten. We bury you up to the neck in wet river sand and that cures... Headache. Cure number nine. We take a live frog and make you swallow it and that cures you of... Stomachache. At number eight, we rub your side with salted butter and make the sign of the cross seven times over the place where it hurts. And that cures... A stitch in your side when you've run too fast. For number seven, you need wool and oily cloth. We cover your head with wool, then the oiled cloth. Water will be drawn out of the head, and when the cloth is soaked, you are cured of what? Water on the brain. There's an old joke that goes, I say, I say, I say, what cures water on the brain? And the answer is, a tap on the head. You would never hear such a pathetic joke on a horrible history's recording, of course. For cure number six, you need a blanket and a pig. To cure a sick child, wrap it in the blanket, Take it to a pigsty, rub the child's head on the back of the pig, and the disease will pass from the child to the pig. What disease? The answer is mumps. A good old childhood illness that gets you a couple of weeks off school. You get swellings under your jaw, and it's painful to swallow, but it could be worse. You could end up being rubbed over a pig, which doesn't seem very fair to the poor pig. <laughs> Cure number five. Take a branch from a gooseberry bush. <coughs> Who put that there? Now, point the gooseberry thorn at your eye nine times and say, away, away, away. And that cures... A sty, you know, the painful boil on the eyelid. If you squeeze it, you get an eye full of gooey yellow puss. Cure number four. Take soil from under the feet of men carrying a coffin at a funeral. Apply soil to the affected part and make a wish for it to disappear. And that cures... Warts. Cure number three. Simply carry two jaw bones of a haddock in your pocket and the pain of this will vanish. And that cures... Toothache. 
and nice painless way to prevent toothache, eh? Unfortunately, the fishy bits may start to smell and you'll save on dentist visits, but you may lose all your friends who think you're pong a bit. Cure number two. Take carrigan moss from the beaches of Connemara. Mix the moss into the food or drink of someone you love and that cures... Love sickness. Once they've swallowed the moss, they will fall in love with you. They may be a bit sick first. Mind you, the people of Connemara don't use the mystic moss for love. They use it to cure their sore throats. Finally, cure number one. You need the skull from an Akil Island monk. Aha, uh -huh, here's one. And some boiled milk. For the cure, you simply pour the boiled milk into the skull. Feed the milk from the skull to the sick person. And that cures... Fever. On Akil Island, there is a ruined monastery with a cave full of old monk bones. If someone in the family is ill with a fever, then the mother of the family must carry out the cure. It's very important that the mother should return the skull to the cave where she found it. Otherwise, the monk will come looking for it. <laughs> Those Vikings brought horror to Ireland in the Dark Ages, but worse was to come. The Normans arrived in 1169. Who invited the Storm and Normans? Well, the Irish king Dermot. He lost his throne to another Irish king and asked the Normans from England to come and help him get it back. Bad move! Once the Normans arrived, they weren't gonna go home. Thanks, dumb Dermot. How nasty were the Normans? Well, look at the first Lord to arrive. His nickname was Strongbow. In 1170, Strongbow's army landed in Waterford. They decided to terrorise the people into giving in. So they didn't simply execute 70 Waterford leaders. They took them to the Baggin Bun Head chopped off their arms, legs and heads and threw the bits into the creek. Nasty. But not as nasty as the story of Strongbow's son. Strongbow was shocked to hear his son was a coward. He said, Better a dead son than a live chicken. So he took his sword and sliced his son in two. Yep, chopped him in half at the waist. And you thought your dad was nasty because he's mean with your pocket money. By 1290, the Irish had more to worry about than the Normans. There was a terrible famine across the land. And 25 years later, the Scots were invading the north under King Robert the Bruce. 300 years after that, King Henry VIII sent an army across to Ireland. He called the Irish savages. He could talk. When he wrote down the list of his enemies, he called it a chopping list. The Irish weren't savages, of course, but they did have some cruel people among them. Take the case of the Kilkenny Witch. In the city of Kilkenny in 1324, there was a family accused of witchcraft, and they had a curious revenge. Dame Alice Keitler was rich, and where there's money, there's jealousy. So the cruel gossips of Kilkenny set to work to destroy her. Four husbands Dame Alice has had, Mistress Black said, and each one dead. Strangely dead, they say. Everyone knows it was murder, Master Ballyragget told her. She should hang for the murders, the woman hissed. But she's too clever to be caught, the man whispered and looked over his shoulder as if the devil himself stood in the shadows. They say she uses the black arts. Mistress Black hardly dared to speak the word. She just moved her fat lips in the shape. Which? Murder was something the gossips couldn't prove. So Rich Alice lived on with her son, William Outlaw, and her servant, Petronella. But the rumours flew around the city and reached the ears of the bishop himself. He called the gossips before him. Dealing with the devil is a serious charge, a burning matter, he said. So tell me what you have seen. The gossips shuffled and looked at one another. Finally, Mistress Black spoke up. Last Easter, I saw Dame Alice sweeping the dust on the road outside her son's house. The bishop wrinkled his long nose in disgust. 
Sweeping the road is not against the law of the church. If it was, Kilkenny would have the dirtiest roads in Ireland. Mistress Black twisted her fat fingers and her gooseberry green eyes bulged. Aye, Your Grace, but she was muttering a spell as she did it. The bishop leaned forward. Did you hear the words? He did, but he durstn't speak them. Speak them to me. The Lord will understand, he said. The woman licked her lips and went on. Dame Alice was saying, May all the wealth of Kilkenny be swept to the door of my son William. Ah, so William Outlaw is in league with the devil too, the bishop nodded. Aye, and their servant girl, Petronella, Master Ballyragget insisted. I've seen her gathering herbs by the river Nor to put in Dame Alice's cauldron. Aye, it's true, the other gossips agreed. And so Dame Alice, William Outlaw and poor Petronella were brought before the bishop and faced with their accusers. Dame Alice shook her head in disbelief. William shrugged while poor Petronella just wept. I find you guilty, the bishop roared. I sentence you to be taken to City Hall, where you will be tied to a stake and a fire lit under you until your godless bodies are burned to ashes. Dame Alice looked thoughtful. William frowned and poor Petronella passed out in a dead faint. But when the next day dawned and the crowds gathered at the City Hall, there was sensational news. Dame Alice has escaped, Mistress Black cried. Used her money to bribe her guards, I'll bet. Master Ballyragget groaned. And they say William Outlaw has offered his money to pay for the finest lead roof on our cathedral, if only the bishop will spare him. The woman wailed. We've been robbed of our burning. There's still the serving girl, Petronella, the man said, and pointed down the high street. The girl was being dragged from the castle, while a silent crowd watched with a mixture of hatred and horror. She was tied with thick rope to the wooden pole that was erected on the cobbles. She was almost lifeless already. Only a soft moaning showed there was still life in her. The black hooded executioner stepped behind her and out of mercy wrapped a cord around her neck and strangled her before he lit the fire. Her moaning stopped. Someone sobbed in the crowd, but no one left till there was nothing but a pile of stinking ashes on the street, and the wind whipped them into the air and towards the cathedral. The stain stayed on the street for many years. But the story didn't end there. William Outlaw opened his chests of gold and paid for the mighty roof to be placed over the cathedral at Kilkenny. It's warm. Mistress Black smiled as she stepped into the cathedral and looked up at the new roof. And watertight, Master Ballyragged added. And so heavy, it's even making those massive rafters sag, the woman said in awe. And crack, the man said softly, listening to the groaning of the timbers as they moaned like a girl condemned to die. The two gossips couldn't tear their eyes from the dark beam as it began to split and show the pale wood in its heart. When the beam had cracked clean through, there was more weight for the others to bear. And one by one, they snapped, with a crack like some hellish whip. The heavy sheets of lead, the price of William Outlaw's life, began to tumble into the church below. The gossips ran towards the altar that stood under the massive church tower. But when the roof fell, it pulled down the tower too. It was over a week before they cleared the rubble and pulled out the twisted corpses. Of course, it could have been just bad luck. Of course, it couldn't have been a witch's revenge, could it? The Irish tried to throw out their terrible Tudor monarch, but their rebellions failed. Henry VIII faced a rebellion from Silken Thomas, so he had him hanged. Elizabeth I's governor said, I have often wished Ireland could be sunk in the sea. Charming. Her armies in Ireland were even more cruel. An Englishman called Sir Humphrey Gilbert described one horribly historical scene. The order from Elizabeth's governor was that the heads of all those which were killed in the day should be cut off. The heads were to be brought to the place where he camped at night and should there be laid on the ground by each side of the path leading into his tent, so that no one could come into his tent without passing through this lane of heads. 
This brought great terror to the people when they saw the heads of their dead fathers, brothers, children, relatives and friends lying on the ground before their faces. Then the English tried a new trick, starving their Irish enemies. They burned the Irish crops and stopped the next year's being planted. By 1602, bodies lay in the ditches, mouths stained green from trying to eat nettles. One of the stories to come out of the 1602 famine was of an old lady who lived near Newry in the northeast of Ireland. Are you sitting comfortably, children? Then I'll tell you her tale. Once upon a time, there were two poor, hungry children who lived on a farm. There was no food for the family and no food for the chickens or cows or sheep or pigs. First the cow died and the little girl cried. But that night the children had cow meat in their soup, so when the sheep died, the little girl didn't cry very much. And when the pig died, she didn't cry at all. But in time, even the pig meat was all gone. And after a week with no food, the children's father died. And they buried him in a shallow grave at the edge of the wood. After another week with no food, the boy ran into the house calling, Sister, sister, there's a fire outside the old woman's cottage on the edge of the wood. She must have some food. Let's go and ask her for some. So the two children ran across the fields till they came to the little turf cottage. The woman was thin and wrinkled as a chicken's leg. Welcome, me little friends. I'm so happy to see you. The old woman grinned and her rotten teeth sparkled in the firelight. Have you any dinner? The boy said. The woman drew a gleaming knife from behind her back. <laughs> I have now. And the tale of the old woman luring children to their death with fires is true. History as horrible as Hansel and Gretel. Horrible history. The Irish have always enjoyed songs like The Wild Rover. But Rover is a popular dog's name, isn't it? So I wonder if the song could have been written for a famous dog. Maybe the Irish wolfhound that went to war at its master's side. If the song wasn't written for that hound, then it should have been. Let me give you the Irish wolfhound's lament. In 1691, the Battle of Offram was finished and done. An Irish officer lay there dead While his faithful wolfhound sat by his head The hound he guarded his master well Though the body it rotted and started to smell The undertakers were all turned back Except when the hound went off for a snack And it's no, they never no, they never no more Will he play with Wild Rover No, never no more The local villagers fed the hound Yet he always returned to his guarding ground And he would still be there to this day But a British soldier passed that way the soldier cried, Do you mourn your loss? You're an Irish wolf hound like your boss. And I'm at war with you, Irish cur. And his musket shot killed it then and there. And it's no, they never, no, they never, no more. Will he play with one over? No, never. Irish dog fell down to the ground And that was the end of the faithful hound Which just goes to show Irish dogs should run When they see the cruel Englishman with a gun And it's no, they never No, they never no more Will he play with wild rover
the dog fell across the bones of his master and they were buried together. In 1649, English governor Oliver Cromwell arrived in Ireland. He stayed just nine months, yet his horrors would be remembered in Ireland for hundreds of years. By 1691, the Battle of Offram saw 7,000 Irish slaughtered and their general lost his head to a cannonball. The Treaty of Limerick put the Protestants in charge. The Catholics were suppressed. By 1704, they couldn't vote or go to school. So it wasn't all bad news. After about a hundred years of this, the Irish were rebelling again. In 1798, Wolfe Tone led the United Irishmen in a rising which was crushed. Apart from getting 30,000 people killed, it only got Ireland's parliament abolished. Ireland would be ruled from London. That'll teach you to rebel, was the message. But again, there was something worse than English rule heading the way of the Irish. The worst famine in their history. The good news for Ireland was that potatoes grew very well in their fields, but the bad news came in August 1845. A fungus attacked the potatoes and it spread quickly over the country. The potatoes looked all right, but when they pulled them up, they were black and rotten inside. Lennox Bigger of Dundalk said this, I tried boiling the potatoes in water. The smell was so bad, I wouldn't even allow it to be fed to me pigs people went hungry and began to starve to death. People would eat anything. The countryside was emptied of its wildlife. An Irishman said, sure we ate the dogs first, then the donkeys, the horses, foxes, badgers, hedgehogs and even frogs. We stewed nettles and dandelions and collected odd and nuts and berries we could find. The people on the coast could eat shellfish but a lot of them were poisonous. Maybe it was better to have a quick death from the poisoning than a slow one from hunger. In August 1849, the worst year of the famine, Queen Victoria, Prince Albert and some of her children decided to visit Ireland for 10 days on a trip to cheer up the starving people. A woman called Elizabeth Smith saw her and said this. She has grown very fat, is much suntanned and too plainly dressed to please the Irish. Yet everywhere crowds of thin ragged people cheered the royal party. The visit cost £2,000, enough to feed thousands of starving people. The famine left bitter memories. It also left a curious, ghostly legend. If you come across a patch of white, unhealthy grass, then it is known as hungry grass. It is said to be the place where the victim of the famine was buried, and it is haunted. Don't stand on it. You will start to feel weak, cold and hungry. If you aren't carrying a piece of bread to eat quickly, you will die. Talking of superstitions, Ireland has lots of tales of ghosts and little people, magic and marvels. Ireland is the home of leprechauns, also known as the little people, probably because they are um, little, a metre and a half at the most. <laughs> You'll recognise a leprechaun man because of the feather sticking out of his green cap. These shy creatures are nervous when humans are around, so you'll be lucky to see one. But if you do, then grab him. <whistles> Secondly, do not take your eyes off him for a second or he'll slip away. And thirdly, promise to let him go if he hands over his pot of fairy gold. <coughs> they all have a pot of fairy gold on their person, so don't believe him when he says, I'm not a leprechaun, I'm a six-year-old schoolboy with a feather in my school cap. Now let me go or I'll tell me ma and she's bigger than you. <coughs> Leprechauns aren't the only magic you'll find in Ireland. If there'd been television a thousand years ago, then a show may have told you how to make yourself invisible. Good afternoon and welcome ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This afternoon we're going to start with a real fun idea. Make yourself invisible. Walk into class and tweak the teacher's nose. Punch the school bully in the belly the way you've always wanted to. Rob as many banks as you can until you're caught by an invisible police officer and locked in an invisible prison, of course. And here is how you do it. First, you need your ingredients. Kill a raven. Split it open and rip out its heart. Or pop down to your local black magic shop and buy a bag of freeze-dried raven hearts. Take the raven's heart, split it open with a black-handled knife. Buy one in the black magic shop while you're there. 
careful with the heart splitting. Get your mum or dad to help you with this and try not to get blood over your mum's best tablecloth. Oh, and don't forget to wash your hands. <laughs> now, make three cuts in the heart and place a black bean in each cut. That's a black bean, kids, not a baked bean. <laughs> Ah. Oh. Now, plant the heart in the ground and wait till the beans sprout. Takes a month or two, so if you don't mind waiting... Oh, all right. Here's one I made earlier. Place one bean from this plant in the mouth, like this. Oh, and say, by virtue of the old crow's heart, and by strength of my great art, I desire to be invisible, and so it will be as long as the bean is in my mouth. And here I am, gone! Yes, I am invisible. You can't see me. No, you can't. I'm totally see-through. See? You can't see me. If I look at myself in the mirror, I can't see... Where have I gone? Where have I gone? I don't... I don't... I don't... Hang on. Hey, how long does it last? Where's that spell? You have made a deal with the devil, and he'll take you off to his home. Oh, hell. <laughs> Horrible history. That's Ireland for you. In spite of some of the misery of the past, it has a lot of magic. Incredible Ireland, in fact. We hope you enjoyed learning about the despicable goings-on of our ancestors as much as we did when we made these CDs. Don't forget to watch out for other CD audiobooks on special packs of Kellogg cereals. You can learn about the rotten Romans, the measly Middle Ages, the vile Victorians, the terrible Tudors, and the vicious Vikings. Look for the whole horrible lot. Horrible Histories are written and read by Terry Deary and produced by Nick Baker for Testbed Productions. Original music is by Danny Fromaggio, sound design by Dirk Mags. Horrible Histories are published by Scholastic Children's Books. And they're really horrible! Ah!